Hello internet and welcome to something completely new for my channel. Today we're going to be sitting down to do an interview with one of the developers from Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. So this is going to be an audio only interview so feel free to boot up Cataclysm and just listen to us in the background. And I recorded this intro and an outro separately so we're just going to jump into it and then at the end I will do a brief wrap up. Okay, hey man, thanks for sitting down with me. You know, this is something I have wanted to do for a while. Why don't you introduce yourself and let everybody know what you're doing here? Yeah, um, I'm Corgent. I am one of the senior developers of Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead. Uh, one of several dozen of us. And um, one of the few uh, lucky individual, well, I wouldn't say luck, that have uh, merge rights to the rep repository as well. Merge rights. So you have the ability to add changes that have been made to the game. Correct. If you make a pull request, there is a possibility that I could be the one to review and have your changes merged to the game. I mean, that's pretty cool, I guess. I mean, I guess you have a lot of power, right? I suppose. Um, but, you know, with power comes responsibility and all that, yada yada. I tend to stick to magicalism uh, pull requests 90% uh, of the time or... The other 10% of the time is either something that I have had experience with or a piece of code that I'm familiar with in some way or am confident that I know about. Yeah, that's neat. Uh, we definitely will talk about magicalism, but I also wanted to ask, how did you find, in the very beginning, how did you come across Cataclysm and what made you, I mean, you have a title, right? You're a senior developer. That's pretty impressive. What got you involved with the project in the first place? Well, first of all, uh, I had to find the game itself. And you might, might not be surprised that I literally just found this game because I was searching for another roguelike to play. At the time, I had been playing Ong Bond. Uh, which is a very nice traditional roguelike where you go down into the mines of Moria and fight. Um, I forget who it was. Po possibly Sauron himself. It, regardless, it's it's very Lord of the Rings, very fantasy vo focused. Um, but I always found that I had a certain enjoyment for sci-fi as well, and that's kind of what el the other thing that drew me towards Cataclysm once I started playing it. It, it was very sci-fi oriented rather than fantasy and so you started making changes to the game uh what got you involved on the dev side all right so the very first change that i made to this game was actually adding um organs to butchering so you might you might know now that if you play if you butcher an animal you'll get heart lungs brains etc well, when I was playing, we were in 0 0.C experimental, and all you got were um, awful and meat and and fat and, and that stuff. So I'm like, you know what? We have a lot of nutrient variations. There's nutrients in the game, and I'm aware that you get different nutrients from different parts of the organs. So let's make it so that you can get different organs from animals. And that was my very first uh, contribution. Uh, I, of course, had to have quite a bit of help uh, from Rowry Gorgonon, if I remember correctly. He helped me set up my visual studio. Uh, it took me like two days to set that thing up. But once I did that, it was actually fairly straightforward uh, because of the particular aspect of the code that I chose to insert myself into. Yeah, I vaguely remember back then, I think stomachs were the only organ that we had in the game at the time. Yes, that's right. And it just kind of grew from there. Um, I remember that, that Kevin was very standoffish at the time because I was a very new contributor. And I kept asking for help, and I got a little bit of help. But it was mostly from some of the other devs at the time who wanted to, who felt like they could help me in a particular questions that I asked about. It was very um, self uh, self-motivated in order to get into the project. And it just kind of evolved from there. I kept making more and more pull requests. And, you know, eventually I got to the point where I did the nested container system. Yeah, that's probably one of the single biggest changes since the last stable, the, the nested container system. How would you, you know, maybe someone's listening who only plays on stable. Can you give a quick pitch on what nested containers are? 
Well, the simplest way to put it is that you can actually put items inside of other items. If you were to analyze how we do inventory in 0.E, you can see that you attach bags and pants and etc. to your body, and that makes an inventory space that has volume. And you put items into that inventory space space, which is attached to you, the character. Whereas what I wanted and what many people have wanted since 2013, if you've looked at the issue that actually requested the change, was that the items were actually in another item. An item actually contained it so that when you dropped your backpack, it doesn't just dump out all the contents that backpack would have contained onto the floor when you drop your backpack and you have to pick them all up again. You drop the whole backpack and the backpack still has stuff in it. So when you come back after fighting that Hulk or whatever that made you drop it in the first place. You just had to pick up one item. It's for sure. It's a very cool system. Uh, obviously, at the time of the release, we didn't have the like the infrastructure for things like item length and stuff like that. But it's been pretty significant. I think I remember Kevin saying that it deserved a stable release all by itself because it was such a significant change to the way the game used to be. So very impressive work, man. I, how much how much time would you say it took you to get nested containers off the ground? Uh, do you want that question in hours, like man hours, or like length of time I spent on it? Well, my guess would be, well, for me, uh, personally, I don't have a real scheme of reference for how many hours it takes to code something. So just like, was this something you worked on for six months, for three weeks? Can you ballpark it? Two years. Two years. Well, that's uh, that's something. Yes. Um, I actually started looking at the infrastructure required for nested containers uh, maybe three months after I started working on the project itself. Uh, if you'd like, I can go into more details in like what that kind of requires. Um, it was quite an involved project. In fact, I would even call it multiple projects. So that's a huge time investment for a single project like that. And and obviously that's something that people wanted for a really long time. You know, we it had been talked about a lot on the forums and on Discord. But, uh, you know, how how do you stay motivated? You know, how do you work through such a huge project and just and keep going? Well, in simple terms, it's because it's interesting. A lot of the motivation that I get for coding things in Cataclysm is actually because it gets merged and reviewed fairly quickly. And <clears throat> not only that, but there are fairly significant things that happen when they get merged. And, it, you know, to, to put it in uh, words that I don't really like, it's instant gratification in a lot of ways. I can even talk about how I did all the stomach changes and people like were complaining about it on Reddit for like two months. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that. That's actually one of my favorite changes that you've ever made, the stomach content system. And it definitely did get some negative backlash. Yes, and uh, I'll, I'll comment that every single one of my projects has had some kind of growing pains from the general community. And, you know, that's basically because I treat my coding and my contributions to Cataclysm as beta features, because that's what experimental is really meant to be. It's meant to be basically a beta. Yeah, and I, and I do think that the community struggles with that sometimes. You know, a lot of us play experimental because we want, like, the cutting-edge features, but I think a lot of people misunderstand that it's an initial implementation of those features. You know, there's always work that has to go in after the fact. Absolutely. Like the nested containers system, there were growing pains with that as well, even though I spent, you know, at the time, about 18 months on it. But I knew that by that point, it was ready for beta testing because it had already gone through several alpha testing stages. And I also knew that if I waited any longer, it would accumulate so many merge conflicts that it just wouldn't be mergeable into the game anymore, and I'd have to redo it in a lot of ways. Uh, that's what a lot of people are forgetting about that particular thing, is that making contributions, especially large ones, you are 
comparing your changes to a moving target because our project changes daily. Um, our most prolific person who merges things is Zulkin Surge, and even though he might not necessarily have a good uh, reputation on the Reddit, he is extremely dedicated in merging pull requests and keeping our pull request open number down. Of course, that has changed a little bit recently due to a couple of uh, issues with the build server and the fact that we're in string freeze. But I am confident that by the time we release stable and about a few weeks afterwards, we'll reduce that number from whatever it is now. If I had to hazard a guess without looking at it, 145 down to under 100 open pull requests. And that's no small feat. You know, I've always been curious about how much you all interact on the project. Obviously, I mean, you're exactly right. It's a moving target. But there's so much stuff that gets merged on a regular basis. And, and it's a, it's the most actively updated game that I have ever followed the development for. It moves so fast. And I've always wondered how... Do you guys have infrastructure behind the scenes? Do you talk a lot on Discord? How do you manage such a huge project with, you know, all these little moving parts? I mean, I know you're not the leader, you know, maybe you're not the best person to ask, but how do you all communicate? How do you keep everything together? Well, in very large part, it is the Discord. Um, I mean, and also the Discord's public, so anybody can join and see our communications amongst ourselves, amongst the devs. The, you know, Kevin's doing such and such, and Silk and Surge is merging things. He doesn't normally talk on the dev, dev Discord because uh, there's not a lot of projects that I've seen him work on except for railroads. But, you know, there's people like Mombun and Candleberry and Mail Clips who all together are working on Aftershock, and they talk about that all the time in, in the modding channel. I talk about my uh, stuff when I'm actively working on something, either in the dev chat or possibly the discussion channel or even the modding channel if I'm working on Magiclism. Uh, there are often new faces that come in and ask for help in order to either set up an environment or suggestions on how they should move forward with their pull request. And, you know, there's some other people who also are working on their own things and they also, and you, and you kind of, you get a feel for it if you follow along with, with the, both the development channel and the dev help channel, because that is our main hub of communication. And if we keep those communication lines open, it's easier to see exactly how we're going to handle everything. Now, you were right in a previous question, you were right about Kevin saying that basically stable 0.f is going to be the nested containers update. The fact that it's gone on this long is in no small part due to the fact that he's had a reduction in amount of time to spend on putting things into the stable release. And, you know, I <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to give any kind of uh I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to give any kind of estimate for when we are releasing stable. Unfortunately. Yeah, I wasn't gonna ask about that. I figured that's something that depends probably on a lot of factors. So this is me on the outside. You know, I don't have any inside information, but I figured with the uh, release of the proficiency system and with Irk trying to get Altica up to date. I mean, I don't. I don't know. I figured those things probably slow everything down. I don't know how much you factor like Altica, but I know proficiencies came in and needed kind of some beta testing seemed like and some people playing with it before there would be a major release as far as i'm aware the most pressing problem is the build server and the website being down uh as you've probably heard the launcher doesn't show the change log and that's kind of a symptom of that problem and we need that problem fixed in order to release the next stable oh okay no i wouldn't have known that exactly so you did mention Aftershock, but you've also contributed, you know, one of the biggest mods attached to Cataclysm, which is Magiclism. It's, um, you know, let's say someone is listening right now, they've never heard of it by some stretch of the imagination. Could you just quickly pitch what Magiclism is in just a, a brief explanation? Sure. So if you're familiar with Vanilla, um, Magiclism is set in an alternate universe of Vanilla where... Magic has always been a thing, and in the industrial era, magic started to decline, especially after World War I. So when you start out in the game, you can be a, ma you can be a mage, you can be a wizard, you can cast spells and all that, but it's not, it's not incredibly common. 
And it is a fantasy, but it's what I would describe as a low fantasy. And I've w- I've wanted to sort of move a little forward into more fantasy, but there's always been some roadblock. For instance, um, I'm not particularly good at making maps. So I've been trying to recruit some people to help me uh, make maps, for example, or make monsters or something like that. I My intention for Magicalism in the very beginning, this was um, almost two years ago, was for it to be a test bed for the spell system. And in a lot of ways, it still is. So I would implement something in the spell system that would allow you to, for instance, teleport. And I wanted a an easy way for players to not only test it, but use it in their normal gameplay. So I would add it to Magicalism, and that would be a magical spell that you get to use. And the cool thing about this is spells are meant to be a more generic way of doing monster attacks, bionics, uh, mutations, that kind of thing. Yeah, I do want to say, I I mean, this is not for everyone. Uh, You know, the people who play the game will not know this, but from a contributor side, magicalism, uh, you know, I'm not a big magic guy. It doesn't really jive for me. So Magicalism isn't really the mod for me, but when you implemented Magicalism, you made it possible to create spells that you can then make into like monster attacks or attach to items or any number of things like that. And that is just, it's so much more versatile than what we had before. So before effects were limited to a very small selection of things, maybe you wanted to modify stamina or HP or something like that, but that was about the extent of what they could do. In order to make like a new proper attack for a monster, you had to actually, you needed, you really needed to know coding. And now with Magicalism and the way you implemented things, it's actually like e- way easier than ever to make new monster attacks and things like that. I really can't overstate it. It's probably like the best thing that's come down over the last few years for people like me who want to contribute or mod. Yes, I would even go as far to say uh, that Magicalism and the spell code came about because we removed Lua modding. And I would never have put all of this stuff into JSON if Lua was still a thing, because people could just write it in Lua. But the thing is, you would still have to be able to code things in Lua in order to be able to put that stuff into the game. Whereas uh, the example... Okay, here's another example of something that I did. There was a translocator mod for Lua that allowed you to teleport from one overmap location to another overmap location. Uh, that was made... Let's see. I, th- I a- You know what? I asked one of the largest proponents of Lua modding, the, the person who really didn't want it removed, and in fact, I think he left the Cataclysm community a while back. His name is Shard. If you guys were have been part of the Cataclysm community for a few years, you might have heard of him. Uh, I asked him, hey, what are, these, what are the mods that you use the most that were Lua mods? And his, the things he told me were Speedy Dex, Stats Through Kills, and the Translocators mod. Now, Speedy Dex and Stats Through Kills were easy for me to implement. I did that, like, in the same day. But Translocators was a lot more complicated. And I looked in the I looked into it and I just made it a spell so that you could cast the spell or you could implement it into an item. And my original thought was, okay, the aftershock devs are gonna want to put this into an item, maybe use some kind of power source. I don't really know, but this is open for them to use because I've no I think it was Candleberry at the time. I told him, Hey, look, I've got this translocator thing. You can use it, just stick it in an item and it's ready to go. Uh, So speedy decks and stats through skills, uh, so they still exist, you just made them into C++ mods or? Yes, that is correct. They are first party mods that are available. Yeah, that's cool. You know, people always ask about mods, but no one ever, no one ever wants to play vanilla, it seems like. I think people are so used to other games where you just add like mod upon mod upon mod. So people often start out playing Cataclysm by using mods instead of playing the vanilla experience. And Magicalism is, I mean, well, I don't personally use stats through skills, and I don't really know, but what does Speedy Dex do? Speedy Dex increases your move speed if you have a high dex score. Oh, that's neat. I, I wouldn't have guessed that. Well, I mean, I, I guess it's right there <laughs> in the name. Uh, but Magicalism is one that people play kind of all the time. 
And you put in all this implementation, you know, you say you struggle a lot with map gen. Is that something that, are there a lot of locations already existing or is that something where unless someone else comes into the project, you won't be making many locations? There are a number of locations in Magiclism now, and I have Wist to thank for that. That's the person who does the change logs, by the way. Uh, yeah. Oh, and people who watch my experimental cataclysm videos, that's Curse Twist. Uh, we've talked about them uh, at length. You know, they do fantastic map gen work. Yes, that's correct. Uh, she's done the black ma- the black dragon lair, and uh, some of the cabins and all, and the vacation home. It's really made magicalism have a significantly larger number of map gen. I've been wanting to do map gen, but I've also been focusing a little bit more on this third party. Well, it's not really third party anymore, but uh, this secondary program to be able to basically paint a map instead of write it all out in JSON. Which is also just a really great idea. Back on C Stable, there was a program that would let you do map gen without using JSON, but it only worked with 0.C Stable. And I think that MapGen is one of the, it's not the most complicated thing that you can do in JSON, but it is difficult for a new person to pick it up. So I think that really any tool that enables people to do that will lead to more contributions down the line. Uh, And you've made other tools as well, right? Like you made a tool so that people could uh, easily add spells for Magicalism? That's correct. Currently, if you've, if you've, uh, you know, browsed our files on the repository, you'll see something called Object Creator. That is the program, actually, that uh, currently all it does is spells, but I'm intending to expand it more. I used a library called Qt. Uh, before, I had made a, ver- a different version of it that was a third party in C Sharp, and I'd, I'd showed that all around the Discord and all that. But the Object Creator is actually using the game's files in order to load in stats and that you can actually for instance say you wanted to make a new monster okay but you wanted it to be a copy of the zombie with a couple of changed things right what you would do in this program is you would go to go to the go to zombie and it would basically use the copy from thing and it would show you all of the stats of a regular zombie and when you changed it it would actually put it into the json that you would uh, output from the program Currently, all this program does is allow you to make spells, which are somewhat complicated JSON entity. However, it's nowhere near the most complicated that we have. And it'll allow you to not only make the thing, but it will basically warn you if there are problems. Like, for instance, if you're just writing it out in a text file and save it as .json, there might be an error when you start up the game. But since this object creator uses the game's files, I can have that error show in a little window on the output window. I'm like, hey, you're going to have this error. Yeah, and in my opinion, pretty much anything that makes the contribution side of it more accessible is good. And like I said, for people hearing this who are like, oh, I don't need to make a spell. Well, a spell can be attached to an item as a consumable, like a potion or even just a food item that has a special effect. It can be attached to a monster so that it can create a monster attack, things like that. And then obviously, you know, creating monsters themselves, people would be interested in doing that. That sounds pretty neat. Yes, absolutely. And if if you don't like the thought of fantasy, you might even be able to call it an action instead of a spell. Because that's really all it does. All it is, is an action. Like, for instance, the most basic spell is it does damage and it has a range and it has an area of effect and that kind of thing. Like, a lot of monster attacks are a fake gun. Well, you know, you could use a fake gun or you could use a spell. Spells always hit. Yeah, or if I were so inclined to add a murderous unicorn to magicalism, (laughs) I could very easily create a special, you know, headbutt attack or something like that and, and attach a spell to it so that it could do something special as well. Right, like cause and effect... Uh, or uh, damage over time, or uh, it affects it in a cone, or something along those lines. Yeah, unicorn headbutts are always in a cone. It's uh, in D and D. It's it's a well known thing. Yes, yeah, very well known. Uh, and I I do have to bring up the, I guess little brother of spells, which I call enchantments. And these are 
basically passive effects, a lot like the effects you see in your character window. And you can attach a, an enchantment to, say, an item or a mutation or a bionic or even an effect nowadays, I think. And th what enchantments can do is they can alter any stat by a percentage or by a raw number. Uh, they can intermittently cast a spell. So, for instance, say you want, say you want to curse an opponent and have lightning strike him every three hours. Well, what you do is you basically, uh, you know, cause an effect on that opponent that has a, an enchantment on it that that has an intermittent spell of a lightning strike and have the uh, time be three hours. And in their most rudimentary form, that would be like making a ring that gave me like a plus two to strength or something like that? Correct. And that's pretty interesting as well. I didn't know that they could be attached to CBMs or mutations. That really expands a lot of what you could do because previously CBMs were tied to statistics or they were like they had their own hard-coded effect. Right, and I will even say that I intend to unify those four things that I mentioned to be a lot more intertwined and work better together so that there is less uh, code copying. Uh, there is a, there's a phrase in, in coding, D-R-Y, don't repeat yourself. And in our code base, I would say that in those four things kind of repeat each other in a lot of ways. And I wanted to try to condense that into something that is more holistic. Not only would it be easier to program new things and additional JSON, but they would all work the same way so that players and devs alike would understand how they all work if they understand one of them. Yeah, it's cool that the mod had such an impact on the core game. I mean, I think that's cool. You know, I, I remember a few years ago, they were talking, some dev members were talking, and I believe Kevin said that he wasn't opposed to adding code to the core game to support modders on the, like making mods. And people kind of had a negative reaction to that, like, oh yeah, we're going to, you're going to do that for mods. But the reality is that you've done a ton of stuff for Magiclism that it's, it's stuff that's benefited the core game. Those two things can go together, go hand in hand. And I think it's like Magiclism is the best example of that. Absolutely. And I was hoping that Magiclism would be one of the forerunners of additional modders coming out of the woodwork and adding their own mods as first party mods so that they could get into the code base and improve not only vanilla, but their own mod. Oh, for sure. And, you know, we have a lot of mods that, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, in, I think it's intimidating for people who want to show up and make a mod. And, you know, even when I first got started, uh, I had Mark, who, who's another dev member, and Kevin, they would respond to me pretty frequently and basically help teach me how to mod things into the game. They were very helpful. But even with all of that help, I was very intimidated about making my first contribution, and submitting stuff to Mainline is kind of scary. And that includes a mod, when I think, you know, many people create mods, but very few people, like, go out of their way to keep them up to date and maintained. It's one of the reasons why Magiclism has remained so steadfast, I think. That's why Aftershock has done so well. It's because there, you know, there have been some passionate people behind Aftershock. And I think a lot of people are really intimidated by making like such a big effort on something that, you know, they maybe don't want to stick with in the long term or just aren't going to be able to stick with. Well, I, I do have a couple of comments about that. The, the cool thing about making a first party mod is not only... Do you have your own creative license because, A, you're the maintainer of the mod, but if you would like to stop working on it, other people will pick up the torch and will continue the work on it. And I think that's, I think that's one of the things that I've seen among this community is not only do people have an odd understanding of mods, probably due to uh, Minecraft's influence, and I'll go into that in a moment, but that they don't want their intellectual property to be changed in any way, even if they stop, wor stop touching it altogether. In, in this particular open project, that kind of runs counter to our own vision of make the game better for everyone involved. Like, for instance, if I disappeared tomorrow 
in my heart, I would have wanted at least someone to pick up the torch of magicalism and continue it. It may change because their uh, individual thought process on how the mod should work would change. But the whole point is that it's a pretty popular mod, if I if I have to say so. And the players would definitely be sad to see it just get obsoleted and disappear because nobody wants to pick up the torch. And with my comment about Minecraft modding, if you look at how Minecraft mods work, you can find a mod that only changes one thing, and then you add that to your mod pack, and you got a, let's say, Emerald Pickaxe mod, and that's all it does. It adds an Emerald Pickaxe and blah, blah, blah. But in Cataclysm, for first-party mods, think of a mod like a Minecraft mod pack instead of a singular mod. The whole point of a mod in Cataclysm is to change the experience from vanilla enough that people want to say, I play Aftershock. So I get to, you know, I'm on this... Uh, distant world in a far future after some kind of apocalyptic event on a freezing cold planet. Or, I'm playing magicalism, so I am an ascended being made out entirely out of mana, and my goal is to create a portal into the nether in, in order to destroy it or something. And uh, somebody wants to say, okay, I want to make a mod that adds fruit pies. Well, wait a second. A, that should be a contribution to the main game, and B, that's not really a mod, is it? It's just a singular item that isn't, it doesn't change the experience in any way. Uh, yeah, and I think there are a lot of people all the time who make these small single change mods that really could be added to the vanilla game, but then they don't add them. And I think, again, at least partially, that's probably because of intimidation, but you're right, it's a collaborative project, and Aftershock is a great example of that. I think currently it's Candleberry, Mom Bun, some other people, and it didn't start that way, right? It started as someone else who passed the reins, essentially, to these other people. Yes, I believe it was Illizen who who was doing Aftershock, and then she made a public post about how she was giving up Aftershock, and then Mail Clips and Candleberry jumped on, on the Aftershock train because they wanted that to work on it. And then Mom Bun joined their team pretty recently. Yeah, and they've done fantastic. It's one of the most popular mods. And you're right when you say Magicalism is popular as well. It's probably the one I hear about the most. I think in a perfect world, that's how it would work, especially in an open source project like this. But I also think it's kind of scary to think about changing someone else's work. So like I personally, I, like I love this game, but there are things about it that I wish were different. You know, one of the things, just anyone who watches my content will know this, Anytime I come across a park and there's like 50 enemies, I can't stand that. I wish it would change, but when it comes to going in and changing something that, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense, it still feels weird because, you know, someone put in that work, someone made that thing, and going in and changing it, it feels, I don't know, like vaguely disrespectful, even though it's an open source project, if that even makes sense. I see what you're saying, and I actually have the opposite view. Because this is probably because I've been a developer for long enough to see this, but there's a lot of situations where people just eyeball numbers or just throw in a number and pull it out of nowhere. Like, for instance, that, that 50 zombies in a park. Well, maybe they chose that, or maybe they just picked a number out of nowhere, and, or maybe they added a zero when they didn't want to. And I would say that it's respectful, even, to adjust the work slightly so that it's still there they still laid the groundwork but you just sanded away a little blemish on the surface uh, which i think is probably the healthy way to approach something like that and in fact i've had other people say the exact same thing and with mods especially you know i think you're right too because magicalism is is pretty popular it's one of the things people ask questions about a lot i do think if something happened someone else would pick it up and run with it and I do think it will be one of the mods that kind of stands the test of time the way that Aftershock has it's been around for years, where there's already a community that has formed around it. So magic, so Magicalism is in repo. You know, it comes with the core game of Cataclysm. Everyone who downloads the game has access to it. So let's say I wanted to make a contribution. Let's say, uh, let's say I did want to add that murder unicorn. How do I, uh, do, do you have guidelines? Do you have a, a frequently asked questions page? 
How would I know what I should and shouldn't submit to the game? Okay, so uh, let's say we're skipping past the whole new contributors field, like, like how to do that. Let's assume that you're either reading up on that or you already know how to actually make a JSON change. There are two documents in the Magiclism folder, one of which is a magic balance markdown document, which is .md, and the other one is a setting.md. And if you read those, you'll see that I have pretty, well, pretty interesting guidelines for spells and not really a whole lot written into the setting. So say you did want to add this murder unicorn into the game, right? You, you read the setting, you read the magic balance, and there's nothing in there about them. Well... The whole point of those setting, the setting and the magic balance markdown is to set guidelines on things I'm aware of and things that I want done. And there is design space I intentionally left blank in those places. So say, say you wanted to write a new NPC into Magiclism, and you wanted to write a whole background and faction and uh, a whole history of that. Well, it's not in the setting. Of course it's not in the setting. I didn't write it. So that is what I want more of. I want more fullness in the setting. So somebody recently added Yule Cats, and I think they were leprechauns, well, because they just wanted those, uh, they, those monsters in the game. And I didn't see any problem with them. Uh, I was a little iffy on the fact that they were Christmas-themed, but, uh, you know... <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, somebody else added, maybe changed uh, Plastic Golem's regeneration rate to lower and their bash resistance to lower to balance them to be slightly less strong. Well, that's totally fine, too, because if you see uh, what you would consider a glaring problem, you would open up a pull request because that is, a lo in a lot of ways, the second way to communicate to the development team, hey, there's something wrong here. There's something that I perceive to be wrong here in, in order to, like, if you're trying to change something or remove something. Like, I am going to require you to explain, but I, it's not really that formal. So you are open to changes outside of what you've explicitly laid out. Uh, and it's worth pointing out that's how the core game works as well. There are people who submit things that don't fit, you know, in the end, and there's a discussion about it, and they kind of have to prove, like, this is how it fits, or, or this is why it belongs here. So it's really not that different from the process of contributing to the vanilla game of Cataclysm. Yes, absolutely. Like, for instance, I remember a pull request a while back about somebody who wanted to make it possible for you to make clothing out of leaves, and they did, did some research, they posted pictures about native tribes making um, skirts and stuff out of leaves, and there was a pretty long discussion. And I don't remember the results of the discussion. I believe it was declined um, because the specific type of leaves they used were tropical and they weren't available in New England. But in Magiclism, you'll find that there's a little bit more leeway in, in, than in Vanilla because it's A, it's a magical world, and B, you know, I'm not really intending it for it to be a hyper-realistic uh, project. So if you wanted to add crazy tentacle monsters, you know, worse than the uh, Shogoths, you know, be my guest. Yeah, tentacle monsters fit in every game. Yeah, maybe one of my maybe one of my listeners can go out and add tentacle monsters. Who knows? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's really cool. I mean, I think having a little bit of a, a looser thing is probably beneficial for a game like Magiclism, where the rules are, you know, a little bit different from Cataclysm, which does pursue realism and true to life experiences in a lot of situations. I also do feel like I have to say that there are have been one or two cont contributors in the past are saying, hey, I'm making a mod. I want to do X. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, that should be in Magiclism. You know, because A, I already, we, everybody involved knows that, that it's not part of ma vanilla, but I have a personal feeling of if somebody makes an individual mod themselves and they don't release it to first party, they allow third party to deal with it, it becomes part of the amalgam uh, mod packs, which I am not a fan of for a couple of reasons. 
and it just kind of becomes part of the background. And I do have to say that it's pretty likely that most of the people who mod the game are using mostly first-party mods, and maybe some of the larger and more well-respected and well re- well-known third-party mods. And I do think there are clear benefits to adding something to Magiclism rather than putting it in your own mod or in one of the conglomerated mod packs, because I think that Magiclism will outlive a lot of those third-party mods, uh, partly because it's first-party, but also because there are people who've invested time and love into it. I think it's more likely to survive over the next couple of years, whereas if I put you know, together a mod and distribute it myself third party, you know, it's going to break. And if I'm not actively maintaining it or if there's not any support for it, it's probably not going to last as time goes on. All righty, let me look through my questions here, see where we can pivot. Um, oh, unless you have, is anything else, did, did you want to talk about anything else about Magiclism specifically? Well, uh, maybe I could maybe I could mention a few things about uh, how the project is going right now. Um, as those of you who play Magic are aware, attunements are a pretty r- new addition to the game, but they're pretty unfinished as well. I do intend to take another look at them right after Stable. I was hoping to get them done by Stable, but I didn't really meet that deadline. I have some ideas for a couple of monsters that I wanted to add. But uh, as far as like maps and stuff, I'm not really that great of a map writer. The only maps that I've really made are like the Demon Spider Lair and like the Magic Basement. And you know, Wist had to come come behind me and like fix up my Magic Basement so that it looked better and all that. And like that, that's another example of somebody who came in and adjusted something that I did because they wanted to make it better. You know. I realize that my skills are lacking in certain areas. So if somebody wants to come behind me and be like, okay, I'm going to make a pull request and change your demon spider lair. Well, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, well, I can see this is obviously better. So I'll take it. So you're actively recruiting basically to, to magiclism. If someone's listening to this and they have an interest, they should start down this path because you are looking for people to help you. Um, specifically in areas where maybe you're not the best at a particular thing, you know, right? You outsource your weaknesses and you focus on what you're best at. So if you're listening to this and you're into map gen, that's someone you would like to get involved in the project. Absolutely. And, you know, there are a lot of areas that are, that could use more and even areas that I'm familiar with, we can always use more because once there are a, basically a critical mass of people working on the project. It'll basically self-propagate, just like how the vanilla game has self-propagated over the years and has developed a large group of, de- of, of developers. You know, say you wanted to add, add a bunch of spells. Well, I was the one who designed the spell system. You know, I'm pretty confident in my own spell writing, but I will, expe- I will expect and accept more people to be interested in writing spells to add to the game in order to have a larger variety for players to pick from. Or say you wanted to add some new code for Magicalism, like new, um, well, spells or enchantments. You know, that is absolutely something that helps Vanilla Game and helps Magicalism in a lot of different ways. Again, it's cool. I mean, magic isn't really my thing. I I do know the community loves it. And it's really neat to see, you know, me as the player. I mean, I've been around since probably about the same amount of time as you, maybe three and a half, four years. And uh, I I don't know, just seeing the evolution of these projects, you know, I remember I remember a time before Magiclism. It's really cool to see that develop. So, you know, props for putting all the work together, everything that you've done. Like I said, I think it uh, it has been a fantastic addition to even the vanilla game in addition to the mod itself. I'm glad to hear it's going well, and I do hope that you find some more people and maybe people put a little bit more attention on magicalism, maybe get a few more people headed your way to work on things. Thank you. And on the subject of supporting you in general, obviously, you know, getting people to support magicalism is one thing, but I know you've also made yourself available to the community over the last year or so. You did those dev vlogs which were really the first time as far as i know that a dev member 
had been really publicly facing like that. I think Irk a long time ago did some like coding streams, but I and I know you did some coding streams and you streamed some gameplay in general. Um, in the description down below, I'll plug your. Uh, well, I mean, really, I'll plug anything you want me to. But uh, what are some things that you're working on right now, or that you do where people can come out and support you outside of Magiclism itself? Well, uh, you can support me with my GitHub sponsors or the PayPal link that's listed on my GitHub sponsors. You know, money is always good. Money makes the world go round. We're in a recession, so I understand if you can't. But uh, some other things that I'm doing that's not magicalism. Well, I've worked on an NPC attack algorithm. So right now, NPCs, they go through a function where they pick what type of attack they can do when they choose to attack. So say your NPC chooses to attack a zombie that comes in nearby. It looks through all of its available options. You know, maybe it has a gun or a uh, grenade or a, a, a melee weapon of some kind, and it chooses the best one out of those options, including the best gun, the best melee weapon, etc. I've gone through and improved that a little bit so that it can be used for things that are beyond just a melee weapon or a gun. I've included spells in my own additional ideas, throwing weapons, which I don't believe NPCs currently do, uh, are going to be implemented right, o right away as well. Um, so you could even equip your NPCs with throwing axes uh, instead of some kind of gun. Well, I mean, we're a shuriken household, but I get what you're yeah. saying. Shuriken. <laughs> Did you uh, actually change their priorities, or was it just a like an expansion of weapon types outside of standard melee and range? I, You know, it's really hard to quantify if I've changed their priorities or not. More or less, what I did is I compared how much damage they do with how far away they are from the enemy. So if you have a zombie that's three spaces away, well, you can't use a melee attack, but you might have a throwing weapon. And I've also weighted it so that it won't throw your only weapon, for example, or it shouldn't. It'll choose a closer enemy that's more dangerous, or it'll choose an enemy that it thinks it can hit and kill in one hit. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. That it The priorities might have changed slightly just due to the fact that I didn't examine and research the previous priorities necessarily, rather than just set in and like, okay, like, what are the priorities that the NPC should consider when making an attack and making a specific type of attack even? Well, so the main reason I ask, uh, there's a long-standing bug with NPC followers where they would prioritize helmets as melee weapons over anything else. So if you have, like, say, an NPC with a baseball helmet and you give them, say, a spear, they'll go whack enemies with their helmet. It's just sort of this funny, goofy thing that was around for a while. I don't even know if it's still around. So I thought maybe this would, you know, reorient that. But you're talking this, I, I mean... It was AI work. I mean, I know Kevin has talked for a while about wanting to kind of address our follower AI stuff. And it sounds like this is in one specific niche of that area with NPC stuff. But that's that's interesting. Yes, uh, actually, that particular bug that you mentioned either will or won't. Uh, that it, it will be directly impacted by the code that I'm doing. I don't know. I haven't tested the baseball helmet versus uh, what did would you say the other weapon a spear? I haven't tested that, but um, that's certainly something that would be affected by this PR. And if it isn't, then there must be a bug in either the stats of the helmet slash spear or something else is wrong, and that can be addressed. Well, that's cool. I, it was just a random thing that popped in my head. It's obviously you know it doesn't come up every day that you're playing. No, and I wasn't even aware of it, so. Um, that's definitely something to consider. Uh, the cool thing about this is I can write coded tests that would check, okay, is this NPC going to use a helmet or a spear? And, you know, make assertions based on that and figure out what, why it chose the helmet rather than figuring out what it is nowadays. Like right now, so let me explain a little bit more of what I did for the NPC attack thing. So say, say you're trying to make a choice 
about what weapon to use because you've already made the choice to attack. Now, what I've done is I've made it so that each weapon has a value associated with it, and that value is how effective that NPC is with this weapon. So say you have a zombie that's two spaces away, just, just within reach of a spear, and this NPC has a spear and, I don't know, a claymore or something similar to that, some really nice melee weapon that they happen to be better at. Well, they'll, hit the, they'll try to hit the zombie with the spear because it's far enough away that it won't be able to hit with its melee weapon because the effectiveness value doesn't exist. Well, doesn't that become complicated when... Well, okay, say, say, so I have no idea. I'm not a coder. Basically, to me, <laughs> coding is magic. But to me, wouldn't that interfere with trying to like weapon swap while they're in melee range? That is also true, which is why I implemented a... This was like maybe a week after I started this. I implemented the amount of time it takes to equip the weapon as well. So the uh, the NPC is going to be like, okay, well, my effectiveness value of this spear is uh, such and such. It takes me this long to equip the spear, so it reduces my effectiveness value of the spear by this much. And if the effectiveness value goes negative... Well, that means they're not going to use that attack. They're just going to either stop and hold or uh, try to use some other attack. So if they had that melee weapon equipped, they might not switch. They might just stand in that single yellow space. Th again, th this is uh, what we mentioned before. This it might go very well go through growing pains because it is all new code. So there will very well be bugs, but I intend to work with Mark, who is probably the main person who's met, worked with NPCs, uh, besides Kevin, uh, who, who really knows what's up. He's actually the one who convinced me to do this particular uh, mini project. Yeah, and I believe, uh, just to give Mark another shout out, I believe he was the one who basically got faction camps to where they are now. Um, with being able to make your own NPC camp. Uh, I could be misremembering, though, I guess. Yes, I believe so. It, it was either that or he worked with D DPWB. Oh, and had done quite a bit of work as well. Yeah, all right. And for growing pains and something like that, I mean, it, so anyone who's followed any kind of game development will know that AI is, like, super complicated. Uh, and stuff like making a decision tree, all that stuff is tough. Like, you literally have to apply values, like you said... Uh, you have to actually quantify the value of that weapon in different situations versus, you know, maybe it is better to take a hit and swap to my better weapon. And that stuff is pretty complicated. You know, it's one of the reasons why AI suffers so much in video games is because AI is difficult. Indeed. Yeah, so that's really cool to see some mov movement there. Like I said, I've I've heard devs talk about NPCs, and one of the things that um, so for me, I when I first started playing Magicalism, I started a uh, a class that could summon creatures. Uh, I love summoning in video games, and what I found was that it used the the regular game's AI, which meant that the AI was pretty not great for a pet, uh, and that frustrated me quite a lot. So really, any improvement in that regard, it'll benefit mods, it'll benefit vanilla. It'll just make a better experience, I think. Yes, absolutely. I have been hearing complaints about, for instance, the Animus class um, summon zombie feature. Like, yeah, I understand. The AI is dumb, but I just haven't, well, I haven't had the time nor the inclina inclination to try to improve the zombie AI if they're your ally. Well, and yeah, I think it's tough, too, because, like, the reality is, so when the game was created, you didn't need complicated AI for a zombie. What does a zombie do, right? It moves towards an enemy and tries to kill it, right? That's their, you know, that's their whole jam. So, you, so you know, adding more complexity on top of that, I mean, I don't, I don't think it was really very necessary. Yes, and I believe Kevin's focus was specifically monster AI, not NPC AI. So I'm in. I'm definitely excited to see how that turns out. I, he's currently focused more on stable, but I believe in zero point G, he's going to be start wor starting working on that more as time permits. That's great. I love. I mean, I don't know how my audience feels about it, but I really love hearing behind the scenes stuff like this. 
And, you know, I'm in the dev discord. I like to peek in on conversations just to hear, I mean, the dev team is pretty expansive. You know, there's quite a few of you who contribute on a regular basis. And, and obviously Kevin works very hard and is merging and checking things all the time. I just, it's neat to hear behind the scenes and kind of have an idea of what's going on. It's, I guess, I mean, it's fun for me and hopefully my audience as well likes hearing these things. All right. So with the AI work, it's great to hear that that's a, an in progress thing. Have you been working on anything else? You know, I, I vaguely remember you working on graphical overmap stuff, but what have you been working on lately for the project? Well, um, graphical overmap has is unfortunately not what I would consider lately. It's It's been kind of blockaded, uh, mostly due to content freeze. I actually opened this pull request in August, uh, if you believe that. Uh, and this particular project, I've posted pictures on the Reddit. I've talked about it in the Discord. You know, I think the, I think the uh, hype has died down because it just hasn't landed yet. But the intent is for tile sets to be able to dictate what you see over on the overmap rather than the f text font. So if you play in a tiles game, you will see in the future, sometime after stable when it gets merged, that tile sets are going to start appearing in your overmap when you open up the map. I imagine initially it's going to be a lot of what we call fallback fonts. So you'll see basically, you know, the dot for the field or the, the carrot for the house. Uh, like you would see a monster that has a missing sprite in a particular tile set that you would use. So I've not been private about this. You know, I've mentioned this uh, on public areas like Reddit and stuff. So I'm sure that some guy, some dead guy is aware of it. But as he does not have a direct communication with me due to circumstances, I've been more open with the internals with uh, Irk and Ultica and also Frizzleman with, um, which, pro which one was it? I think MSX was the one that he was doing. Uh, he also does Brown Like Bears as well. But I personally was working on Retro Days because I actually have the artistic capability to make a 10 by 10 pixel sprite. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, I made about 200 sprites in order to uh, post uh, an image of my current overmap on the Reddit. This was a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm sure if you go to my username in Reddit, you can find it pretty easily. But let's talk about something that's a lot more recent, like um, the limb stuff. Oh, yes. Very exciting. Yes. So um, we've been talking, I guess we, the devs, we, the community, everybody has been talking about wanting to have their limbs amputated and be able to grow new limbs and that kind of thing uh, directly related to mutations and all of that as well. I have been ma t making the first steps in order to be able to make this a reality. And you'll actually find, well, if you're, if you browse the code that a lot of our code assumes that you have two arms, two legs, a torso, and a head, which actually has problems when you try to be like, okay, well, I want to gain a mutation that makes me lose my legs and, I don't know, turn it into a tail or something like a lamia or uh, grow two arms and have four arms, right? Or become an etin and have two heads, there are a lot of assumptions that the code makes, which makes it kind of important for me to go through and fix up all the infrastructure, which is what I did in this first pull request. I even made a debug mutation in order to lose all of your limbs except for your head. I, I uh, did, a think, two streams um, with Headman, and it was very entertaining until I realized that I couldn't pick up anything or wield anything. And uh, every time I walked, it was like a hundred and or no, a thousand eight eight hundred moves in order to walk one square. So Headman was very short lived. Uh, zombies always ate his face. I mean, I find that interesting. I do think it would be probably be very difficult to pick things up if you were, you know, just a head. You know, well maybe you could get like a dexterous tongue mutation or something like that but uh, yeah i mean that's so interesting if the but if the code is constantly calling and expecting five limbs or whatever what a 
I mean, that sounds like you would need to change a ton of stuff. Yeah, it does sound like that, doesn't it? But if you, uh, I don't know, let me check my pull request here. I know that, um, oh, yeah, okay. So if you look at the pull request, you'll see that it's only about 560 lines of code, which is a lot less than I was expecting. Even. This guy, only 560 lines. Well, yeah, and a lot of that is JSON, actually. So call it 350 to 400 lines of C++ code. So were body parts listed in JSON, or is that something that was completely hard-coded? Body parts are in JSON, yes. There were a lot of things that I could have done just with JSON, but the things that the code assumed made it difficult to not make additional C++ changes in, in order to circumvent those things. So if you, for instance, you could do this right now. You could take away all of your body parts and only have a head. But the game wouldn't start up because it would assume that you have legs because it's checking to see if you're wearing shoes, for instance. That's actually one of the functions. It checks to see if you're wearing shoes because it modifies your move cost when you walk. So you can't wear shoes if you have no feet, right? So I had to basically circumvent that and be like, okay, well, do I have feet? Okay, if I have feet, am I wearing shoes? And, and there's a lot of stuff like, okay, are my arms broken? Can I craft something? Well, I don't have any arms, so they can't be broken. Or, or s things of that nature where it's like, it makes sense to make that assumption if you're just had no mutations in the game whatsoever. But with the scope of mutations as they are and the scope intending to expand with uh, mods specifically, because I don't know how much we're going to get into that in vanilla, although I might still try to push some of this into vanilla. I just had to make some changes in order for it to work properly. Well, my question would be, uh, so you don't think the majority of this will be impacting vanilla? Uh, obviously, the code will be there to support changes in the future, but so should, uh, should we not expect possibly growing an extra arm in vanilla? Not initially. Um, because there's still quite a bit of code and some weird growing pains to go through. But I'm expecting to actually change out some of these mutations, um, like the tail mutations, for example. I intend for you to actually grow a literal tail in the game that you have to clothe in order to keep warm or you get frostbite on it, you know, something like that, where it shows up in your plus armor sort menu as one of the limbs that you have attached to you. Well, you definitely just made a lot of furries very happy. Yeah. That sounds, uh, yeah, you know, that sounds very complicated. And again, I say that as someone, you know, I'm not a coder, so I don't really know. But I'm just thinking of all the stuff. I mean, like the minute you mention armor, there are so many menus that need to be added to. You'd have to track armor class and HP and coldness, all that kind of stuff. That sounds really complicated. Right, which is why I say it's it's definitely not going to initially impact vanilla because we need to get the foundations laid first. And we're going to work on this in baby steps. So the first thing that will happen is probably tails. And maybe those will just have a higher tolerance for temperature just because there's not really any clothing item that you can put on a tail, for example. I think this is super cool. I would love to see that. I, I do think... You know, this also fits with vanilla. And I find on Discord when people talk about this and they start talking about like, I don't know, limb destruction, someone will inevitably start talking about Dwarf Fortress. But the current system isn't terribly robust. And I think, well, I, I was really excited for the wound system that was supposed to be coming. Uh, there had been a lot of talk about it coming over this last stable. And they had talked about the wound system and increasing the way medical treatment would work in the game. I think with the addition of more like grievous wounds, I think limb loss and or, I mean, obviously on a mutation and CBM side, it makes sense, but also the idea of like permanent damage to a limb is something I'm very interested in. And I'm really curious to see how all of that shakes out. Yeah. And it's funny that you should mention wounds because that is going to be one of those projects that I'm going to be taking on as well. But this limb stuff is a prerequisite because I want... I want wounds to be attached to the limbs in the code, basically. And I needed to make sure I totally understood how it worked. And uh, if you were to be attacked, for example, and in the, in the code right now, you take HP damage to that limb or, or the attached limb if it's not a main limb, 
like a hand becomes an arm, for example. And what we need to do, in a general sense, is convert that damage into some kind of map from damage and damage type to wound. So say one cut damage is a mild scrape, or it could be a mild scrape or a, or a medium scrape or, or medium cut or something like that. Maybe there's a little bit of randomness to it so that there's a little bit of a, a little bit less, um, you can't predict exactly what wound you're going to get when you take damage from an enemy. It's going to have some random element. So what we're going to have to do is I'm probably going to work together with Urk uh, once he comes back from hiatus, or possibly work with one of the other devs if he's still on hiatus when stable after stable comes out to actually help me make this map in JSON. And what it'll do is it'll open up that possibility for uh, either lasting wounds in possibly a mod because I believe that's not really in the spirit of vanilla because it's not fun to get a permanent wound and um, so stuff like that. So one thing I do feel like I have to mention and talk about is people, pretty much everybody who's, who's been a proponent of this particular project has always mentioned Dwarf Fortress. And I have to mention, I have to say that this limb system is not based on Dwarf Fortress in any sense of the word. You will not be able to target particular limbs in combat you will not have your arm decapitate. You're, you will not have your arm amputated in combat, because if you were to have that happen, that's just basically death anyway. Oh, a hundred percent. That's something that comes up constantly, and people talk like, "Oh, I just want to be a torso," but the reality is, you know, you would just die. So it's kind of nice to hear you say that. Right. So the only possibilities, the only possibilities, is amputation. For, for example, infection and a doctor amputates you because you won't be able to amputate yourself. That's another thing that movies really exaggerate. Well, sure. You would probably end up dying, frankly, trying to amputate your own limb in the middle of the apocalypse in non-sterile conditions. It would not be a great situation. Yes. Not to, not to mention possibly losing consciousness in the middle of doing it and then ending up bleeding out when you're unconscious. Yeah, shockingly, sawing off body parts is best left to professionals. And self-surgery, I mean, honestly, this comes up all the time as well because Cataclysm is a game where you're largely, you're self-sufficient. But honestly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you'll be moving a lot of the severe wound stuff. It's, it's going to be probably something that you would preferably get treated by an NPC doctor or surgeon because honestly, self-surgery, even in the best condition, is like already super dicey. I believe so. Um, this is getting off into, you know, uh, part D, and I've only gotten into like part A, but uh, I believe we do want to start pushing forward factions as your way of getting into the end game rather than currently you just go into the lab, you get a bunch of stuff, now you're end game. You know, that lasts, that takes you what, a couple of hours, maybe? To, to get all the stuff you want by raiding labs. You know, I've heard a lot of people mention that labs are actually super easy compared to other, compared to other starts, not even to mention other challenge starts, because the lab is meant to be a challenge start. Yeah, I think, you know, I do hear that as well. But I also hear people say things like, oh, the prison island is so easy. But then when you talk to them, you realize, like, they ignore the challenge completely and they just swim away. So when I hear people say, like, oh, the lab is so easy, what I think they mean most of the time is, oh, I specifically tailored a character specifically to escape the lab, and then I followed a very narrow path to make my escape. You know, I don't really do anything. I just grab the loot that I can get a hold of, and I do the same thing over and over, and I just try to escape. That's really not the experience that the scenario is trying to put forward. It is meant to be a challenge. And I think for newer players or people... Like, if you use a random character in a lab, I do think it's a tough start. I don't, don't get me wrong, as an experienced player, the science labs do become pretty routine after a while. You know, they have the same layout blocks, and you learn where the turrets are, and I, I guess they do become pretty easy after a while, if I'm being honest. 
All right, Internet, so at this point, Korg had asked if we could take a break, but unfortunately, I had some family stuff come up while I was recording. We talked for about an hour and a half. Um, I'm guessing after editing, it'll be about an hour. So this might be a bit of a weird cut, but I'm actually going to jump to Korg here, kind of giving his final thoughts and saying goodbye. So let's do that now. Okay, well, um, thank you so much for this interview. I'm hoping this will be enlightening for your listeners. Uh, I'm always interested in trying to reach out to the community, and I've never really been good about keeping a schedule, like for streaming or for YouTube videos. But if you subscribe to my YouTube, I might post... I might be able to post a dev blog fairly soon after Stable, which I intend to do, which talks about these particular things in more detail. And that internet was my first ever interview. I think it went mostly okay. Thankfully, Korg is is a really nice and kind of easygoing guy who, you know, he didn't seem to be bothered by my ineptitude. So I'm going to link to his YouTube channel down below so that you can keep an eye out for any of his upcoming dev vlogs that he might be posting. And of course, I will also link to his Twitch and GitHub sponsorship page. Uh, GitHub sponsors, if you're not familiar, it's kind of like Patreon, but it's specifically for coders. And on that note, mostly Cataclysm is a passion project that people work on for free. So if you want to support the project, head on over to the sponsors page and kick Korg a few bucks. I've also seen Kevin, you know, the leader of the project on Cataclysm, uh, has pushed this link before, so I think it's got that that stamp of approval from the boss man. So you should definitely head over there and check it out. And with that, Internet, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I would like to do more of this kind of content in the future. I did have some issues along the way that hopefully no one will notice. My audio might not be perfect. But for now, I have no plans on the books to do any follow-up interviews or anything like that. Keep an eye on the channel so that you will be apprised if something like that ever comes up again. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.